Well, and Christian, one thing that strikes me is six of the 10 largest fires in California history have started since 2020. They're getting bigger just in the in the recent years. Wild. Welcome back to another episode of the Fifth Wall Future World Vodcast, where we bring you the latest advancement on climate tech and break down all the topics that are climate news related. In this episode, we have a special guest with us, Arvin. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Christian. Arvin works at Pano, and we brought Arvin in because we want to talk about all the smoke. We want to talk about all the smoke, all the wildfires that are going on in Canada right now. We are the eastern seaboard of the United States. Arvin, can you explain to us what the AI and Pano AI stands for? What, what's going on there on the tech side? Sure. Great question. So AI here is really being able to leverage artificial intelligence and deep learning to be able to detect fire starts as quickly as they emerge. We're doing that leveraging visual spectrum, being able to see smoke. 10 miles out, 15 miles out, it's a it's an incredibly hard challenge because you're trying to pick up smoke in a whole bunch of different types of environments. So you can imagine picking up smoke in the 22 microclimates in Northern California. So what you're seeing up in the coast looks very different to what you're seeing in areas that uh, where there's no marine layer, it's much drier. And we've got to train the model to really be cognizant of all those environments. We're also deployed in places like Aspen or Big Sky, where we see smoke and then there's snow and then there's fog and no such concept of fire season anymore. So it's really being able to train the model to pick up smoke in all kinds of different environments. And what we try and do is be able to latch on to those incidents locate them, and then provide that actionable intelligence. One quick call out here, though, is that most everyone's talking about the air quality, but not the actual root cause, which is the wildfires. A lot of these images, it kind of reminds me the red sky day in San Francisco. I remember walking outside in San Francisco, it was noon, and we could barely see past 30 yards. What I think is really evident is it's no longer an issue that people are seeing in the wildland environment. We're seeing smoke come in all the way down to the southern parts of the U.S. from what's happening in Canada. You know, what's interesting with Canada is I saw what Minister Blair put out, which is the amount of acres burnt so far is 10 to 15 X the average for the last 10 years. These are scenarios where you're seeing exponential events. And sadly, we've seen that in Australia and we've seen it in the US. I think people are generally kind of unaware of all the fires that actually happen every year and every fire season. And now that they're getting so big, I mean, it's becoming just such a hot topic issue, obviously, right? You can't avoid it. Um, it's affecting your daily life. You know, I, I saw these stats where New York's air quality is significantly worse and other cities that are notorious like Delhi, Jakarta, Manila, et cetera. So wild. So want to jump into one of our first questions here, Arvin. Why do these mega fires keep happening? It feels like when I was growing up, you know, there's maybe one summer I can remember growing up in Northern California where there was an air quality issue because of a wildfire nearby. And now it feels like my wife and I are contemplating the fire season as like our vacation season of like, where should we go to get out of the smoke? Yeah. And Christian, I, I grew up around fires. I grew up in Sydney as a kid. So bushfires are what we expected every summer season. And so what's interesting is if you look at the last couple of years, I think the first thing that it is really clear is this concept of mega fires. Right. We saw the complex fires in California where you had million acres fires. The second thing that we're seeing is just the persistent hot temperatures. If you double click on what happened in Canada, they had the driest April on record in many of these locations. They had 10 plus degrees Celsius. I get excited as a Aussie to use Celsius. So you've got dry and you've got increasing hot. And what's interesting is the traditional Canadian fire season hadn't even started. So we're no longer seeing this concept of seasonal fire behavior. It's become a fire year. So hotter weather, drier weather, and it's really persisting throughout the year. You know, one additional data point I'd throw out is 
We saw the number one story on the 31st of December in 2021 was the Marshall Fire in Boulder. And sadly, there were 1,134 homes that burnt down and there was snow on the ground. And if you look back 10 years ago and you think, hey, could there be a, a large wildfire with snow on the ground? You just wouldn't believe it. And I think we're seeing a lot of this with fuel buildup and, and just when you've got that ingredients of fuel, hot, dry, and, and strong winds, it's really, really hard to control that. Totally. Another thing we don't recognize is that we kind of help create this problem as well as, you know, we don't let any of these sometimes, you know, naturally occurring fires like a lightning strikes, you know, go through and we've, we've been so good at just like mitigating so much fire that we've created this like giant matchbox problem where now we like really got to get to work on this um, because the fires are getting so big. And just a, a quick couple stats. You mentioned a couple of like the higher temperatures in Canada, an article from the Washington Post on this. There's 437 active fires across Canada. 248 of them are out of control. This is all according to the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Center. The western province of Alberta has 73 active wildfires. Quebec obviously getting super hard. Yeah, so here's Quebec. The French-speaking province led the country with 154 active wildfires. And this is equating to nearly 23, or I guess year to date for Canada, nearly 2,300 fires had burned roughly 9.4 million acres. Unreal. Unreal, unreal problem. I don't think there's any geography that's necessarily going to be really immune to wildfires like this. We've seen geographies as, as far as Siberia experiencing wildfires. I mean, a lot of the focus has been on suppressing fires and we don't do as good a job of preparing the forest itself, especially it's no longer the season, it's for the whole year. So I think we really need to leverage a lot of the tech and the intelligence that we have for better forest management as well. In addition to being able to fight the, being able to respond to these megafire incidents faster. So we really see this as a combination and that's really the only way you can kind of address it because it's a all year problem. We see a lot more fuel buildup and you've got to be able to treat the forest when you can. And you've also got to be able to get to incidents faster. So we talk about how no one's really going to be immune to this. Canada obviously getting hit hard on it now. The Western United States has been battling this for what seems like the past, you know, five, 10 years. Like what countries, regions are we seeing that are booming with adoption of new tech right now or maybe leading the fire tech charge? Where does this compare to Canada? Were they just way less prepared in these events than other countries? Or is this just, you know, everyone's kind of early stage here as well? Yeah, Christian, I think my assessment is you need a forcing function to kind of think differently about approaching these type of incidents. If I look at the U.S., it really started from the 2017-2018 season, and that really had a lot of people step back and think about how do we respond to these mega fires? Because when you get into these situations, the resources are tapped out. And you talked about the 200 plus fires that are out of control. At that point, you just don't have the ability to respond to all of them, right? And they're out of control for a reason. So what needs to happen is, you know, a combination of much better actionable intelligence and being able to leverage technology as a force multiplier. So as I think about areas and regions that have moved on this, it's really been driven on the back of having gone through these type of incidents in the past. States like California, Oregon, Washington have been pretty early Nevada, et cetera. And then now increasingly we see states like Colorado, uh, Montana, Idaho, and it's no longer just kind of the West. We're seeing a lot of this in the Midwest, the South, and and it's going to be across the country. The next region I'd call out is Australia. Now, Australia has had an interesting past couple of years. So 2020, which was the Black Summer fires, and I had a lot of friends and others that were evacuated on beaches. So the visual that really struck with me is a visual of a kangaroo with this burning landscape. And that was the front page of the New York Times. And it's just one of those images that is really hard to unsee. For Australia, they really 
wanted to understand how do we make sure that we plan for this and these type of situations don't happen again. And if we think about the learnings from those incidents, the smoke led to a lot of downstream health impacts. There was a lot of mental health issues as well. Australia then went through two years of rain. So I think when they were thinking about the preparedness in many ways, they had the wet season to kind of say, okay, maybe it's not going to repeat as much. And then now a lot of the news that we're seeing out from our Australian partners, customers, and others is they're really expecting going into a very dry season. The other parts of the world that are really paying attention, Europe last year had major incidents, places like France. What was interesting is we, we've been talking to folks in France and Spain and other markets. There are places like Normandy where the concept of wildfires you would just never imagine. I think so far, my assessment is the adoption in tech has not been as much as what I've seen in the US and in um, Australia. You can't bet that like these incidents aren't going to happen anymore, right? They're, they're going to happen. It could take as little as a cigarette butt, right? <laughs> to start a potentially sure. massive fire. Well, and Christian, one thing that strikes me is six of the 10 largest fires in California history have started since 2020. Right. So if you just look at the the need for urgency, one, they're getting bigger and actually they're getting bigger just in the in the recent years. Right. So the other thing people need to understand in this whole equation and with building and resiliency, adopting new technology here is that we've really been in the stone ages with wildfire technology, right? And there's been no development. We're sending people off to the front lines. They're digging fire lines with, you know, picks and shovels and we're trying to spray water and, you know, maybe spraying down, you know, FOS check ahead of a fire to mitigate, you know, these these big mega fires. It just seems like a pretty miserable job. Well, and, and and because these incidents have gotten are getting so much worse Christian, safety is a huge concern because you're you're out in these environments and, you know, I know in the Australia scenario or, or what's happened in California and uh, some of the other Western states, a lot of these firefighters are in harm's way. We've talked a lot about the issues. We've talked about different countries and where they're at in the wildfire space as well. Now unpack for us wildfire tech space and how Pano is playing here and what you are trying to do at Pano to mitigate, to, to help with this issue going forward. You know, Christian, I think one of the first things that that we look at is every large fire starts as a small fire, right? And the the key, and I think this has been the prevailing thesis from a lot of the leaders in the industry, a lot of the leaders in the fire space, which is the way we're going to really address these mega fire incidents is to really understand where they've started, how they're spreading, and really think about rapid initial attack. So it's really focused on early detection, followed by rapid initial attack. And technology can play a key role in this, but it needs to be a combination of technology with the resource and the operational response all coupled together. I think one of the first things that we wanted to focus on is how do we provide that actionable intelligence? And when I think about actionable intelligence, cameras, especially with the advances of camera technology, coupled with artificial intelligence, being able to detect smoke 10, 15 miles out within the first minutes. And then being able to triangulate that location and give that visibility to fire authorities and other stakeholders, right? Utilities, so they know uh, where is that incident uh, relative to energized power lines, right? Or private stakeholders, where they're thinking about critical assets or evacuation routes or the safety of personnel or even the broader community. And then the second thing that I would look at is being able to really think about many different data sources. Cameras happen to be one data source, and they're incredibly powerful because you can zoom in and you can get that ground truth. But cameras coupled with satellites, right? We've got geostationary satellites, we've got LEOs, we've got a whole bunch of satellite tech that we can pull from that are also going to give us heat signatures that are going to, and then there's some DOD intel that can be pulled into this as well. You know, we've, we've picked up many incidents and one of the ones that jumps out at me was the one in Montana where there's not a lot of people that are out in big sky. We picked up an incident from a, a location where we were deployed on top of Lone Peak. So 11,300 feet off the ground. So literally bird's eye view. We picked up smoke two ridges over and the town of Big Sky is down at the bottom. So impossible 
to be able to see that unless somebody happens to be in that area. We picked it up, we notified, and within minutes, the the fire chiefs and, and the response agencies saw that and said, hey, that's a high rate of spread incident. And they called in aerial response from Bozeman within minutes. So what could have been an incident that would may have spread into hundreds, if not thousands of acres, they were able to contain to under 74 acres. The other thing that we were able to do is really provide the ability for the fire engines to be able to navigate to that location more effectively, because a lot of these are called in on back roads, right? There's multiple situations where, you know, you could have hikers that are seeing smoke in Yosemite, or you could be off a freeway and you would just call it in and you'd call it in and say, I see smoke in a certain direction. And the fire authorities at that point would need to go do the smoke check and they'd need to send out engines. And so there's a lot of that time that gets lost in terms of being able to confirm the incident, locate the incident, and then think about what the response is. And that's really what we're doing in the early moments. And then we also provide that intelligence so you can look back and learn from these incidents. So that's that's our focus. But as I think about broader fire tech, there is a lot of other things that we're seeing coming into this. So spread modeling is incredibly important. It's not just where it started and where it is, how it's evolving in the moment, but being able to predict where it could go in six hours, 12 hours, because that'll also allow you to kind of think about resource allocation down the track. Think about evacuations and other elements. Totally. Yeah. The the impacts of these fires, right? We're just going to keep learning more and more. I just wanted to highlight, I think, you know, kind of big picture here as we close that like there is this big issue, but there are solutions coming to market. Pano spearheading or being one of the those solutions that is really spearheading the fire tech movement. So yeah, I'm I'm you know I'm super stoked about everything you're working on at Pano. Remain a, a Pano fan and loyalist over here at Fifth Wall. But yeah, just wanted to thank you for for coming onto the podcast today and walking us through all this. You're you're a class act and a good friend and mentor. So really appreciate the time. Well, thank you, Christian, and, and I love the work that you guys do, and more broadly, uh, what you're doing at Fifth Wall. Appreciate it. <laughs>